This is the story of a dance revolution and the mavericks whose radical ideas change dance forever. It terrifies me because he's created a sense of chaos. There isn't a part of it that didn't break every rule. The thrill of destruction, the jubilation of saying, old generation, it's our turn to create a revolution. Told through some of the key works that overturned centuries of tradition. They were saying it was ugly, it was disharmonious. And the dance critics were given earplugs. By challenging the establishment, confounding audiences, and even causing riots. It's not about swans or royalty, those strange notions that, that Ballet had come up with. I wouldn't shave my armpits, or I had a papier-mâché bun on my shaved head. These are the ideas that made modern dance. Ideas that reflect the spirit of the time and express the very essence of what it is to be human. Take it into the sagittal plane. Put your feet on the ground. Feel the freedom of the body in space. And in order to do that, you know, get rid of your clothes. With the students of one of the leading contemporary dance schools in Europe. Contraction step. Back. We tell the story of the rebels who made modern dance. Have a vision. Other than that, it's not dance, it's what? Exercise. It was definitely very rock and roll. We always said, you either live or die. Come on. It's something that no one else had done. The dance I'd been trained in was holding a chair and doing repetitive things at the age of four that seemed so not related to dance at all. And she was actually a free spirit. Isadora Duncan was an American whose style broke free from the rigid conventions of classical ballet. It was always on the side of the ruling class. It was always in a grand opera house, would, would be very set to certain conventions, a sort of three or four act ballet, very opulently styled. came about the driving spirit of contemporary dance, which has always been to reinvent itself as a language for the expression of new ideas. I think what you're talking about when you talk about Isidora Duncan is this kind of freedom from convention. What is your voice? What is your kind of expression? Um, and so I, I guess when I think about her, that's what I, I think is really kind of paramount, that she just did what she wanted. She's a pioneer of modern dance, and the fact that her writing was part of her art of course, she was a dancer, but I could read some. It's hard to underestimate the importance of Isadora Duncan then, partly because she was such a personality cult. I mean, people thronged to see her. We have no idea if she was such a great dancer, but she had immense charisma, immense personal power on stage. I think it's frightfully important to preserve the link from one choreographer to another. I think it's absolutely essential for the public to be able to judge and to see the progression of choreographic intent, so to speak, through, through all the different choreographers. I think a heritage is something that's invaluable in, in, in a great company. The Trinity Laban Conservatoire of Music and Dance preserves the ideas of its creator, Rudolf Laban, very carefully. Then from there, going to impulse upwards. Ah! Yeah. Now, going to really find the handle here, but I want you to read... Valerie Preston Dunlop was a protege of Rudolf Laban. She's overseeing rehearsals of a recreation she's made with colleague Alison Curtis Jones of a dance from Laban's early career in Germany in the 1920s. 
Good. So flat tabletop, back. Yeah, good. Now, remember, you have to keep your face forwards because when we wear the masks, you'll see that that is, is giving us a very powerful image. Laban was an intellectual and a teacher. He experimented with movement choirs, theories of movement, and invented a form of modern dance notation. And he was the founder of Ausdruckstanz, the dance of feeling or expression. Laban is a fascinating, complex, mysterious character. He's a von, so Laban has a privileged upbringing. But he is an early 20th century dropout. He lives the bohemian life in Munich. He doesn't really know what he wants to do. And somehow he ends up doing movement and dance. His father was a general. He's expected to go into the army. He knows how to organize people. And that's what he kind of does for the dance world. Laban didn't come in and teach. He would come in <laughs> and whatever was the uh, topic that he was struggling with of the moment, he would use us as, uh, as it were, pawns in his, uh, in his study. So, I mean, sometimes he was interested in how the history of dance had changed from time immemorial. So he'd come in and we would be doing ancient Egyptian uh, stuff in, 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 in pyramidal forms. So it wasn't like a college or a school. It was just a group that seemed almost random people who were passionate about this. Laban established his first schools in Munich in 1913. And in the summers, he ran a dance school in Monte Verita in Switzerland. It was the home of a community of artists and intellectuals who were experimenting with a new way of living. It links in a way to a particular moment in the 20th century when people are looking to mysticism as a way of escaping the horrors of what's happening. You know, they were nudist vegetarian dancers and they would uh, devise these mystical ways in which their movements would represent the movements of the planets and they would somehow also represent the golden section. These kinds of um, ideas around golden rules that, that determine all of us. But it was one of Laban's first protégés, Mary Vigman, who was to distill his key ideas into her iconic work, Witch Dance. The first Witch Dance is in January 1914. She wants to find what movement can do without the scaffolding of music. And she dances this in silence. And the Munich intellectuals are staggered. This is the most modern thing they've seen. That's what they write. This is the absolute dance. Absolute, it's pure, it's abstract. There is no story. This is pure dance. Then she makes a second witch dance, which is the one we have film of. She creates the movements herself, and then a musical accompaniment of gongs and drums is set to it. So it's not danced in silence like the first one. Um, and the movements of it in it have an incredible force. She's also wearing a mask. I mean, it's so powerful. And what is so wonderful about it is the musician is following her, not she following the music. And that changes radically the relationship that has come right through contemporary dance. The relationship of dance to music was an issue to which Laban devoted himself. He is quite adamant that until dance is relieved from being music 
visualization. It cannot lift itself out of being bottom of the pile in terms of hierarchy and significance of the arts. So he's politically active to that extent. And in order to do that, fundamentally, it must become a primary art and not a secondary art, by which he means take the music away. Kurt Jos was another Laban protégé who also went on to make groundbreaking choreography. In this film, he's dancing in a Laban work. But when he formed his own company, he combined Laban's methods with techniques of ballet to make a new form of political dance theatre. In 1932, The Green Table, an audacious anti-war piece, won the first international award for choreography. The opening scene with the diplomats, they are the gentlemen in black. and they negotiate with elegant, flowery gestures. Yet you know underneath it that they're out to outdo one another, and they start this war. And the figure of death comes at the end of each scene and carries somebody off. And at the end, the green table returns. So the story of the ballet is this is just going to go on and on. We've got to do something about it. The Green Table was the first ballet with important ideas behind it. There are what I call the gentlemen in black, which are the ten figures around the Green Table in the beginning and are in masks, out of whose machinations results war. But the war is suffered and borne by the people. Kurt Jos's statement on the inevitability of war was soon to become a reality. Just one year after the Green Table's creation, Hitler was made Chancellor of Germany and the Nazi dictatorship seized power. While Jos and his Jewish company members fled Germany, the Nazis appointed Rudolf Laban as their head of dance. People have confused him with being a Nazi, but he wasn't. But he was employed by them for two years. And yes, he does sign his letters, Heil Hitler, because if you didn't, you're out. I mean, you don't have a choice whether you sign a letter, Heil Hitler, or not. The Nazis censored many forms of art, but their ideals of physical perfection meant Dan still had a role to play as a propaganda tool in their plans for the 1936 Olympic Games. Goebbels wants to present something modern and progressive about Germany. So Laban creates a movement choir with a very Nietzschean message. Remember, and his ideas are absolutely egalitarian. No discrimination whatsoever. Well, of course, he's in the wrong place, isn't he? So the battle is set. Goebbels attends the dress rehearsal and Goebbels suddenly realises this isn't National Socialist philosophy. Goebbels writes in his diary, I don't like this. It's dressed in our clothes and has nothing to do with us. I forbid it. The opening night of the Olympic Games included choreography by Mary Vigman but not by Laban. The Nazis took away his position and closed his schools. In 1937, Laban was given refuge in England, where he set up his first British dance school in a small room in Manchester. As a German national, he wasn't allowed to earn money teaching. Instead, he was employed to use his skills to analyze the movements of factory workers. He had no money, absolutely nothing. He was going into factories and studying what the workers were doing to increase the war effort, basically. And I went in to help him with that. So the one that I went into was Pilkington's tile factory. And I had to analyse exactly what, what, what was going on. 
And then we'd come back, you see, into the studio, and he would get us uh, to do all sorts of physical works, physicals of hammering and of slicing and of these sort of things. And in the evening, we might well do a lecture demonstration somewhere. OK, here we go. Uh... One of Laban's most important works is Green Clowns. And heads. But like and most of his early works, it's been lost. Together and... It's very interesting how we deal with our heritage, which has disappeared. <laughs> That's the trouble with dance. Shift. So, Green Clowns, we know it existed, but we do not know what its outer form was except through the, I think it is, six photographs that we have of it. But we do know how he created. You're making tiles, like you have in your bathroom, and in order to do it, you have a conveyor belt, which is about the level of your tummy, going along like that. Although Green Clowns was made in the 1920s, Valerie is using her own memories of the factories in the 40s to reimagine the dance. A little stick, and you pull it down, and it's hard. Then go and take hold of it. It's still delicate, so careful. Bring it in towards you onto the conveyor belt, and it disappears. So it's quite fast. It's one, boom, bum, 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 one, boom, bum, bum, bum. Ah, and there it goes on and on and on and on and again and again and again. <laughs> yes, that's the horror of it. It comes down on a direct path with an impact. And there is a kind of different approach to uh, moving and also to, uh, to experience the space around you. So it's really, really tiny movements and really strange dynamics that we are not really used to, to use. So it's a kind of total experience of using your body in a different way. We know that there was a section about the conveyor belt, which had just been invented, but we don't know exactly what movements were going. So I introduced the conveyor belt that I knew all about from working in Pilkington's tile factory. There is music in a rigid rhythm, and it's there to make the dancers conform to that kind of movement, which is extremely uncomfortable and unpleasant to do. It's all a metaphor for the machine age in position on the human body. While modern dance was breaking new ground in Europe, one woman was pioneering her own distinct language of movement in America. I was very much frowned upon by the audiences because uh, they'd expected me to be very lavish and very uh, wooing and attractive and uh, we won't use another word but uh, you can guess for it and i remember as a woman's club in the south i was dancing lamentation and part way through the dance a little old lady got up and came forward and she put her hands on the platform and just looked at me just moved her head like this Martha Graham was one of the many artists in the 1930s and 40s who sought to create a distinctive identity for American culture. No one in the history of American modern dance was to have a greater impact than Martha.
One of the remarkable driving forces of the contemporary dance scene was that it was very, very profoundly driven by women. So contemporary dance was reacting against ballet, which had always been a male-dominated profession. Although the ballerinas were stars, the ballet masters were men, the choreographers were men, the company directors. Her narrative works, like Appalachian Spring, reflected the nationalistic feelings of the time and helped to make modern dance popular. Robert Cohan, who was to become one of the founders of modern dance in Britain, joined the Martha Graham Company in 1946. Like all those people who do something special, she was so focused and so intense when she was working that you didn't dare interrupt it by, by not paying attention, even. You, and you were learning so much. It was Martha's invention of a new dance language, the Graham Technique, that became her lasting legacy. In this film, one of her dancers demonstrates how the technique is based on breath and shows how a contraction and release of breath produces dramatic movements. Well, contraction is breathing out and release is breathing in. That's the most basic it can be. So the, Martha got known for the contraction, although everybody all over the world contracts all the time, every day because it was a good way to express a kind of grief or pain in the body. And since her dance was narrative and included nice times and bad times in the story, the body folding in on itself was very important as an emotional uh, movement, as an emotional contact. Martha takes contraction and release. And then, because Martha is a very passionate woman, you know, where does this contraction take place? It takes place right in your gut, and in particular, lower down into here, right into the stomach, here, here, into your groin, into really, should we say, nearer your sexual center. So her, her movement is very passionate, it's very womanly, to press the chest up, lift. Her technique spoke of a landscape of the heart. She wanted it built on Give breath. Time, establish that spine nice and long. How does breath affect the body dramatically? From a ha to a laugh to a cry, how does that all affect the body? And then how can you put that in movement? Generations of Graham dancers went on to teach Martha's style across the world. Now spiral. One, two, three, Thea five, Barnes joined the Martha Graham two, Company in the 1970s, three, where she came to understand the, the minutiae of the technique. Two, three, return. Martha would sit in those company classes and we would discuss every single principle of every inch of the technique. Contract, lift one, two, contract, opening. They were two, analyzed, broken three, down, three, built back up and broken two, down again so that they would meet her specifications for her use in the technique. Towards the end of her life, Martha created a piece that displayed the technique. For me, Helios is exhilarating because it is actually a Graham class, but it's what you call theatrical lies. This is what Martha was best at. This is what she did. She told her stories using a movement vocabulary that had its foundation in the dancers knowing Graham technique to what I call the nth degree. I 
think with Martha Graham, you did get a sense that actually here was an art form. It's a measure of her genius as a choreographer. It's a measure of her extraordinary potency on stage, but also of the absolute determination with which she kind of created her own empire. She made her own language. She made her own repertory. She made her company. She created her own posterity as she was making her work. By the second half of the 20th century, Martha had become an American icon. Her fame raised the profile of modern dance and helped it be recognized by the establishment. There was one young dancer, a soloist in Graham's company, that was to take modern dance even further. We are presenting dancers from our repertory. The various dances are intended to be an activity of humans moving in different ways and making different images, which may give to each of you a different impression. Merce Cunningham wanted to make dance for dance's sake, ridding it of meaning, expression and story. I am so deeply fond of movement by itself. That is, I can enjoy it without thinking it has to have a meaning. So we are presenting movement to which um, anyone can bring whatever each individual thinks, rather than it being my telling them how to think. His approach was hugely influenced by composer John Cage. They met in the late 1940s and they became lovers and artistic collaborators. Cage was a leading figure in post-war avant-garde music and his radical experiments were to have a profound effect on Cunningham. I came to the intention of making my work non-intentional because I had no desire to express my ideas or my feelings. I wanted rather to open my mind to what was outside of my mind. Cunningham adopted Cage's theories of using chance in the creation of his choreography. It is an idea that comes from the I Ching, where you can cast your fortune, and what you get is an answer that is, is suitable, so to speak, for that moment in time and space. Well, I thought, rather than my making the decision as to what follows what, I discover something else. Cunningham and Cage took this idea of chance to extremes by making the choreography and the music separately. Although he commissioned new scores, he didn't choreograph to the music. Um, it was always said that the dancers never actually heard the music they were going to be performing to until the dress rehearsal. Now the dance and the music are truly independent of one another. I have no idea of anything that will be happening in the dance. Merce has not, no idea of what will be happening in the music. But we have a kind of um, confidence that they will work together. The first time I ever saw Merce, what I remember most vividly about it was that I'd never seen anything like it and I didn't know how to read it. And that when I was sat there, I was panicking because I was constructing a way of trying to put these disparate pieces together. We've got this conventional idea, haven't we, that music and dance in some way have to be synergistic and that is our aspiration as um, dance makers to make that the whole. Whereas actually when you look at something like Merce, the body all of a sudden comes to the front and the John Cage score might actually just support that. Then the John Cage comes to the front. All of the hierarchies of the ways in which we traditionally think about how dance and music should go together are subverted. And cue. Daniel Squire danced in the Merce Cunningham Company for 12 years. He's using these methods of chance with the Trinity Laban so, students to make a min event, a collage of Cunningham extracts. Very often he'd be rolling dice or he would throw a coin to get an answer yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. 
And if it's a duet, do they come in together? Yes, they're coming together. Is he carrying her? Yes, he's carrying her. So you've got run, 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 trip, run, run. We've used quite a lot of chants. All the sections and who is in the sections have been made on chants. So we'd just sit there with a the dice. And if it was evens, you'd be in the piece in that section. And if it was odds, you wouldn't. In classical Cunningham style, we are wearing unitards. And whichever colour and what style you'd get was all done by rolling a dice. Cunningham's rehearsal process was also distinctive. We rehearsed in silence. It was very, very austere. He never said anything. He never gave corrections to anyone, whether physical or about performing style. It was very, you, you had to be completely self-motivated and simply be there and do. <laughs> One of the things that he was doing was timing it with a stopwatch and have us run a section again if it was you know, anything other than negligibly longer or shorter. One, two, three. Everybody just loves him. You do anything for him. The company class was completely electric. You just, the amount of sweat, the amount of work we did, and, and I never encountered it ever again. Cunningham's work requires great skill to execute. And while some audiences were initially perplexed by the abstraction, the critics came to love it. The first time I saw a work by Merce Cunningham, I wept because to me, there's such possibility, such inventiveness in the work. It, it, it almost, to me, represents the ultimate in terms of the spaciousness, the sense of what dance can be, that he's a choreographer I can see over and over again and never tire of. I thought it was a very puritanical, very repressive way of looking at the world. So I thought it was time to say yes. Carol Armitage was a classically trained ballerina who danced with Merce Cunningham. But in New York in the 1970s, she decided to rebel against her mentors and her peers. I just felt like I was doing something from the 1950s. This was the late 70s. I want to do something more contemporary, more of my time. So I thought, why not combine the refinement and poetry and loveliness, beauty of ballet with the raw, visceral energy of, of punk? But I was, and to this day, have, am, am much a, a paria, you know, for, for many people because I've betrayed both ballet and modern dance. In that fuck you attitude and it's, it's our turn to create a revolution. I did a piece called Drastic Classicism with the loudest music probably ever played in the front of the public. You know, when you're young, you have no idea. I mean, it was, but it was just so thrilling. And it was minimalism combined with electric guitars. And that kind of contradiction is still really what makes art interesting. It's not about being in the middle, it's about being at the ex extremes. This year's Edinburgh Festival now in full swing, its first dance event has already caused a stir. One critic has called his show an incoherent outrage, the sort of establishment reaction which Michael Clark may regard as the ultimate accolade. Rubbish. Disappointed. Yes, I, I'm maybe not an art lover, but that wasn't art to me. I didn't understand a word of it. It is a cacophony and probably an atrocity in some respects for some people. And I brought I brought friends along. Students at Trinity Laban are rehearsing a version of the seminal dance piece Rosas Duns Rosas. 
created in 1983 by Belgian choreographer Anna Theresa de Kiersmarker. In this film version, the dancers perform everyday gestures repeated with military precision. The choreography was made in the early 80s. So it was a time of punk. And it was, uh, that choreography definitely carries the sign of the times. There was a certain energy, a certain provocative element. It is extremely constructed. And those four young women throw themselves against this wall of structure. elegance and intelligence and the way it is constructed like a moving architecture that celebrates the human body is just exquisite. De Kiersmarker adopted this technique in Rosas Duns Rosas but gave it attitude. These gestures seem to be teenage stroppy gestures. It's got this bullshy teenager shrug, and yet they're all doing them in unison, so that you think they're individual, you think they're personal, but actually, this is a mask that they can hide behind. I think she is really using femininity as a choreographic device. There's lots of pushing the hair behind the ears, adjusting the clothes, taking the a shirt off the shoulder to reveal the bra strap and then clutching the breast. This iconic feminist work has been widely performed for 30 years. real investment in the aesthetic it's just a surface copy it wasn't until she saw a YouTube clip of schoolgirls doing their own version of Rosas Dunst Rosas that she knew how to respond friend sent me a little video of four schoolgirls who made a version of that of um, to just like a virgin. And I found it was very, very beautiful. So I thought the time came to give it away. The first part is what we call the nodding. The, the Kiersmaka says, rather than sue for copyright, anybody can do it. And this is where the Re Rosas remix project comes in. She asks some of her dancers together with herself, to teach it via YouTube tutorials to anybody that wants to learn it. Four and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and one, two, three, four, you stay, five, six, seven. But then there's this kind of viral invitation to produce lots and lots of different rosas, dance rosases. So you download it into your body, you remix it, and then you upload it onto the internet.
you bend over, then you come up and the right hand you place on your right leg. Martin is working with Trinity Laban students to produce their own Rosas remix. So it doesn't go, it doesn't go back too far behind the chair. Two, three, four. For me, I thought, well, OK, we could just remix Rosas, or we could try and put in other forms of, um, of movement that come from other sources. So really try and think of that upward movement as this first and the only moment where you stand. Which is what if somebody remixes a music track. They may borrow from sounds outside of the original track. So I showed them some clips on YouTube, they copied, and they started to build that into the structure. I remember when I was younger watching various YouTube videos and trying to imitate it, but never before has it been done where it's been so open and such an easily accessible opportunity and project. Great, much better already. I definitely feel like the female is definitely being empowered because there's such a routine, there's such a boredom with daily life that comes through in the piece, um, which I definitely take a feminist stance on. But one choreographer, Pina Bausch, embraced the opportunity to create work on a grand scale. She did so in a way by bringing dance closer to theatre. Her starting point, she always says, is that she has a feeling, a taste of something that she tries to give shape to. And she works very closely with her dancers to get them to respond to ideas, to images, to confess feelings they have, to talk about dreams, to talk about memories. It was not theater. It was not dance. It was not a piece of music. It incorporated all of it somehow. In Café Müller, Pina drew upon her childhood memories of hiding under the tables in her parents' café, watching the customers. trained in ballet, she does have very strong links with the German expressionist scene. It's in this willingness to confront what's sort of strange or grotesque in us. I think one of the reasons why people travel the world to see Pina Bausch's work, why her choreography has a cult following, even if she didn't herself, is that they do see themselves reflected in it. While Pina went back to her roots in German Expressionism to develop her unique vision of dance theatre, one dancer, whose roots were in ballet, set about reinventing its language for today. I was working at the Paris Opera in 1987, and I did a phrase, and at one point, one of the etoiles burst out laughing, and I said, what's so funny? And she said, that doesn't exist because of, uh, of its, um, its combination was not, according to her, legal. Yeah. And I said, well, now it does. <laughs> so she believed that things could not be recombined outside of this received notion of its uh, appropriateness. As director of Ballet Frankfurt, William Forsyth was inspired by modern dance to question the language of ballet. It's never a question of pushing the language of 
ballet. It's a question of sensing what it can do. And you realize that what's taught is just one set of possibilities. <laughs> What I did was I presented ballet situated in the power of the dancer's body. It wasn't put in the story anywhere else. It was only in the body. And there was no real decor. There was no costuming, really. Forsyth took inspiration from the ideas of Rudolf Laban, whose spatial theory of the body as living architecture broke down movement into geometric shapes around the dancer. In ballet, we've got here I am in the fifth here and here I am and here in the second here. These, these are places that I'm then going to, to know and use. Now, if you're seeing this as living architecture, you're seeing that there's a connection between this and this. And there's a line that you can see that is between the two. And that line can be moved and can be contracted and can come to make a point and can be moved sideways. Now we're making centers where two parts of the body meet. There she goes, hand to knee, back of his neck. At Trinity Laban, Valerie is demonstrating Forsyth's techniques. Now from that center, they're going to extrude a line. Can you see between her knees, between his hands, between his elbows? See, the centre in ballet is usually here, and we go all round the edge of it. Now he's saying, what about making other centres? Other centres. Other centres. Other centres. From which lines can emerge? And then he goes on and say, those lines can be replaced. So here's the line, there it is, and I'm now going to replace it there. And I'm then going to replace it again over there. I mean, it's fantastic. This is the Royal Ballet performing William Forsyth's Step Text. I remember the very first time I saw Forsyth. It was the first time I really saw kind of a classical uh, vocabulary, but pushed to straining. Um, that there was a sense in which this protected this um, this codified style, which in some way um, had constraints, no longer had any constraints. Um, and it really struck me quite quickly that actually ballet is a contemporary dance language. And I just thought that that kind of glint of light around the classical canon was really extraordinary. I think I spent a lot of time building bridges between communities in the dance field, trying to maybe open up the idea from people in the ballet sector that it is possible to think differently, yeah, and also to address the contemporary community and say that within the practice of ballet, there is not just one thing happening. As the 20th century came to a close, choreographers could look back over a hundred years of modern dance for inspiration. Lee Anderson, a former graduate of Trinity Laban, made this work, Smithereens, in 1999.
when I started work on Smithereens, it was continuation of a, um, a way of working that I've been developing over maybe 10 years, which was to collect images that I found really interesting and group them into categories that I understood to suggest certain kinds of mysterious dances. It might be something about a gesture or the spacing of an image or the atmosphere or a group relationship. Lovely. What comes after this one? It's this one, isn't it? The... Yeah, this one's here too. The Trinity Laban students are working with the images that inspired Lee. So the head and neck coming right across the body. And they're working on movements with Lee's assistant, Gabrielle. And then this hand together. So we're waiting three, four. I've never worked from images before. It gives you like a fuel. So you see the image and there's an obvious shape. Then you also, um, Gabrielle and Lee got us to think about um, like why, what is the image and why are they stood like this? Or why are they, um, what does this mean? Like, is this questioning or is this like giving? This is a picture of a fascist speaking, an expressionist fascist. This is Martha Graham. This is Bronislav and Nijinska. And these were all just gestures that I was going to use for the Vigman dance. Really, I just wanted people to move from one image to another in different gestures, and they were very expressionist. And it has nothing to do with Vigman's own real dance. It's about my take on the imagery that I find of her dances, added together in the wrong order, with a few odd things put in. I like the idea as well that you might, I don't know, live on another planet and you get all this imagery coming to you on the internet and you might have this idea about what dances you've read about it, but you might not know. You might have a go yourself at making some and it would be completely wrong because you, know, you don't know. You don't know how people would ever do it. So, um, yes, I always pretend I'm a Martian and a, a Martian dance historian. <laughs> References to cabaret and vaudeville, and I guess that I've always had an interest in that kind of populist theatre. I want people to come and see dance who aren't just people who would go and see things in a large opera house or a large dance theatre. It's for everybody, and I love that connection, and I think that everybody would love dance if only they saw the right kind of dance for them. Today, students like these at Trinity Laban have inherited the legacy of the rebels who made modern dance. After a century of breaking boundaries, dance has become a melting pot of diverse styles. For today's choreographers, anything is possible. With the internet and YouTube, the whole world of contemporary dance has changed because now, instead of having to wait a few years for Netherlands Dance Theatre or Pina Bausch to come to your town, you can go and see that material online. Um, and uh, so, so audiences are more informed, but also uh, choreographers can see so many different influences and they draw that into their work. People often say, who is the next Pina Bausch? Who is the next Merce Cunningham? I'm not sure that's going to be the case. I think there are many of them. They're all uh, people who are emerging together in a different kind of world. <laughs> Akram Khan is one of the biggest names in contemporary dance. A British dancer who combines his training in classical Indian dance with contemporary influences. <laughs> My influences were Michael Jackson, Bruce Lee, Muhammad Ali. They're all physical people. I knew I could not do Kathak. 
to the way Kathak dancers do it in India. It's just, I had too much of Michael Jackson in me. I had too much of Bruce Lee in me. So where does that leave me? Because I went into contemporary dance. And the more contemporary dance I did, the more affected my Kathak. The more Kathak I did, the more it affected my contemporary. So I had to find my own authenticity. Contemporary dance is also, um, it's very dangerous to assume that it belongs to one place. The kind of force of contemporary dance, the, you know, the mega, the, the godfathers or godmothers of contemporary dance were mostly in the West. Um, but it's, it's shifting and it has to shift in order for anything to, to transform and survive. It has to borrow from other things. Another leading choreographer is Wayne McGregor. He creates work for the Royal Ballet and his own company, Random Dance. He draws upon technology for inspiration. We have access to great research. We're able to sit online um, and be able to cull uh, phenomenal amounts of really interesting images and written information that really fuels process. But also there's a real fantastic potential to be lost in that. You know what it's like when you sit on the internet, all of a sudden you start here and you end up here. And this here place, not only the journey, but this here place is super interesting. The students at Trinity Laban are rehearsing a Wayne McGregor piece, Polar Sequences, from 2003. One of the things I wanted to just try was a series of kind of non sequiturs. I wanted to make a piece which didn't have flow. So at that, that time it was interesting that it was talking about uh, a convention of choreography where one thing had to seamlessly move into another. There's a sense in which you didn't want any irritation. And so that piece is about that. How is it that you kind of build some disquiet between things that literally slam from one thing to another? The curtain goes up uh, when I go and see a production from around the world. You have no idea what's going to happen. You really don't. And um, you go and see Romeo and Juliet, you know it's going to end in tragedy. When you go and see contemporary dance performance, the whole point is you don't know what to expect. It's its greatest uh, asset. Uh, and I love the fact that it's always reinventing itself. While technology provides a valuable tool for documenting the history of modern dance, one choreographer is considering how to preserve the dance heritage that lies in the memories and bodies of the dancers. Boris Charmat curated an event called Musée de la Danse and transformed Tate Modern into his vision of what a museum of dance could be. I would call it almost like a flash mob or, or a collective choreography. So my own work, but uh, mixed or intertwined with moments where people could just join in and do the choreography move themselves. <laughs> 